What's going on everybody and welcome back to another video. I could not be more excited to bring today's video to you guys. This is a Czech Dark Lager. I'm excited for a number of reasons, but number one, Czech Dark Lager, as many of you know if you've watched many of my other videos, is simply just one of my favorite lager styles of all time. It's a really, really difficult beer to find here in the United States. I think the best example I could find here in the Northeast is Tamave, which is brewed by Notch Brewing. They do everything very traditionally. And that really leads me into my second reason for being super excited today. And that is because we're gonna be brewing this Czech Dark Lager in as traditional of a way as possible. What this means is doing a double decoction mash, fermenting this in a traditional lager fashion and actually cold storing, lagering it for a long time until it's ready later, probably in like the late fall to early winter. But I'm also going to be serving it in a very traditional way, which I'm really excited about as well. Uh, this hopefully should be enough to satisfy all of you lager purists out there. I'm not just doing it to satisfy the snobs, but I am doing it because it is super authentic and sometimes there's a lot of value in just doing things the old fashioned way, the hard way, because you understand why these beers are the way they are. And then you get a lot of appreciation for uh, what goes into making them as well. Czech dark lager is a really interesting style though. It's unlike any other dark lager. The closest thing to it is a Schwartz beer, which is actually slightly roastier in character than a Czech dark lager is. The color is honestly about where the dark character of the beer ends. It's a pretty traditional lager base with mostly Pilsner malt, a little bit of Munich, a little bit of Kara Munich, and then you're just adding a sprinkle of roasted malt at the very end of the mash to give it some color. And then just a little kiss of roastiness to be honest, but you don't want to any sort of coffee roast, you don't want any smoky roast, you just want a little bit of a chocolate character in there, to be honest. Uh, it should be nothing like a porter or a stout or anything like that. Now, of course, you don't have to do this with a decoction mash and doing it like the hard way if you don't want to. It's perfectly reasonable to substitute in about two to five percent melanoidin malt into the grist and doing a step mash instead. Uh, that'll get you a very similar character, not quite the same, to be honest, but a very similar character and enough to pass by, I think. As I did in my Oktoberfest uh, this year, you can also generate plenty of melanoidin by doing a 90 minute boil instead of a 60 minute boil. Just scale everything down and account for the gravity increase and the utilization increase in props. Before we jump to the recipe, I want to thank a couple organizations for helping make the video possible. Firstly, Northern Brewer, they provided all the ingredients that you need for the batch of beer, so check them out if you want to make this beer. And secondly, Blickman Engineering for making the system that I'm going to be using today, the Blickman Brew Easy Compact Surface. This will be the second brew that I've done with it following my Oktoberfest. Um, just getting to know it a little bit more as I brew with it more. Um, it's an interesting system. So for the grist on this beer, it's pretty simple. Um, just four ingredients overall. You're starting out with 10 pounds of Vireman floor malted Bohemian Pilsner malt. This is an under modified Pilsner malt, which is important when we're using a decoction mash. The decoction mash is going to help increase our efficiency and uh, get the most we can out of this floor malted malt. We're gonna follow up with a pound and a quarter of Weirman Bark Munich malt. This is gonna help flesh out the middle of the beer a little bit, uh, and it's some breadiness, and also uh, some supplies for melanoidins as well. And then also a bit of Kara Munich 2, a pound and a quarter of that. Kara Munich 2 is gonna give us a small amount of dark fruit characters, and a little bit of sweetness in there, but it's also gonna help us raise the final gravity on the beer, because we wanna make sure that this thing doesn't really finish any lower than about 10, 12. Czech lagers typically have final gravity somewhere between about 10, 12, and 10, 16. And this is actually very important because it helps add a little bit of sweetness to the final product. It helps really boost those uh, complex sugars and the complex malt characteristics that you get out of them. It's a very, very important characteristic of all Czech lagers. So we wanna make sure that we have a little bit of a boost in the final gravity there from that Kara Munich malt. And then lastly, for color and for that little kiss of roastiness, we're gonna add in only six ounces of Carafa 3. Um, so this is actually not even gonna go into the main mash. We're gonna add this in at the very end of the mash, um, basically at mash out. So we get the color contribution, little tiny bit of flavor, but you're definitely not gonna run this through the decoction. You're definitely not going to have this sitting in the main mash for the entire thing. For hops in this beer, it's actually relatively hoppy as far as lagers go. Most Czech lagers are. Um, somebody once told me that Czech dark lager is actually just a dark Czech pilsner. Um, I found that very interesting. I'm not exactly taking that approach today, but I am going to uh, not be holding back when it comes to hops. So we're gonna start out with one ounce of pearl for about 23 IBUs, going in at 60 minutes as a bittering hop. 
Then we're gonna add three ounces of SOTS uh, at 10 minutes. This is gonna give us about seven and a half IBUs. Uh, so our total IBUs are coming around about 30. So you'd want to use some sort of traditional Czech hop in terms of flavor. Usually you wanna use SOTS or Sterling or uh, Slotta Cops. Those are all great options. They really get you a lot of very special spicy character uh, that makes these lagers what they are. For the water. And this is one of the single most important ingredients when it comes to brewing Czech lager properly. The water has to be soft. It has to be almost next to nothing in it. Depending on what your water source is, you usually are gonna want to either um, dilute it with distilled water or just start with RO water and add a very small amount of ingredients to it. That's what I'll be doing. So the water profile I'm aiming for is incredibly light. 17 parts per million of calcium, zero parts per million of magnesium. We'll get some from the grain anyway. Zero parts per million of sodium, 16 parts per million of chloride, 18 parts per million of sulfate, and zero parts per million of bicarbonate. Um, and in order to get that water profile, I'll take eight gallons of RO water, which I'm collecting right now, and I will add one gram of gypsum and one gram of calcium chloride to the entire thing, and that is it. This soft water guarantees a soft character in the beer and really just allows the delicate character of these beers to come through. For yeast in this beer, it's very important we're using a proper Czech lager yeast. We're gonna be using Y yeast 2278 Czech Pilsner. Even though this is not a Pilsner itself that I'm brewing today, it's the same yeast. Because this is a lager, because I wanna do things uh, in, on a reasonable time frame, I did make a starter for it. I made a two liter starter with two packets of Czech Pilsner yeast um, and let that go for a couple days before today. For the mash in this one, it's complicated. This is a double decoction mash. So um, not as complicated as a traditional triple decoction would be, uh, but with the dark lagers, double decoction is actually more common than triple decoction. So there's four steps to this mash. It's gonna be a protein rest, a beta sacrification rest, an alpha sacrification rest, and then a mash out at the very end. Um, but the decoction is only gonna happen between the beta rest and the alpha rest, and then between the alpha rest and the mash out. So the way this is gonna work is I'm gonna start with the protein rest, when I mash in at the protein rest temperature of 131, hold that for 15 minutes. As soon as I mash in, I'm gonna pull out 12 quarts of thick mash for my first decoction. And we're gonna hold that at a sacrification temperature of 152 Fahrenheit for about 10 minutes. This is gonna guarantee we get the conversion that's in the decoction out before we denature all those enzymes. We're gonna hold that for either 10 minutes or the entire length of the protein rest, whichever happens first. And then uh, I'm gonna use direct heat to recirculate and bring my mash up to 146 Fahrenheit for the beta rest, that's the main mash. My decoction, which has already undergone its sacrification, uh, is going to then get raised up to a boil. And we are going to boil the decoction for about 30 minutes. Um, which is probably, after including ramp time, about as long as it's going to take to get through that uh, beta sacrification rest. So once the main mash has finished the beta rest, I'm gonna go ahead and start gradually adding the decoction back into the main mash, stirring it up, and just checking that temperature very carefully until we reach that target alpha rest temperature of 158. At that point, I'll make sure that we're holding 158, and then I'll pull my second decoction out from the uh, main mash, and we'll start raising that up directly to a boil. No need to wait for a sack rest on that second decoction. We're gonna boil the second decoction for about 15 minutes while the main mash goes through its alpha rest for about 30 minutes. And then at the very end of the alpha rest, I'll add the second decoction back into the main mash and raise us up to a mash out temperature. We'll hold the mash out temperature for another 15 minutes before draining the grain basket and carrying on with the brew day as usual. Now, if it's not entirely clear how that decoction works still, that's okay. I'm gonna go over it during the actual brew day footage as well. And then I'm also going to take some time here in the near future to build out a very dedicated, deliberate how to decoction mash video, which I will hopefully be able to answer all your questions in um, as well. Uh, this is not a simple process by any means, so don't feel bad if you don't quite grasp the concepts yet, um, but it is a truly interesting one and something that's well worth learning how to do uh, and doing at least once if you haven't tried it already. It's been about a year and a half since I've done a decoction mash, um, so I'm very excited to get back into it. It's quite the process, um, but it is a lot of fun at the end of the day too. Anyway guys, I can't wait to get going on this, so uh, without further ado, let's get brewing. I started out by adding eight gallons of reverse osmosis water into my 10 gallon Blickman Brew Easy compact surface and started to heat that up to the first rest temperature of 131 Fahrenheit. 
while this was going on, I milled out my grain, just being sure to separately mill out the carafa, because that is uh, not going to go through the decoction, it's just going to get added at the very end. I also measured out the absolutely minuscule amount of water salts that I would need to add to this, and added those into the strike water. Once I reached the target dough-in temperature for the protein rest, I doughed in with all of the grain except for the carafa, and stirred it up thoroughly, got it all well distributed, and then immediately started to pull my first decoction. The first decoction was about 12 quarts of thick mash that I pulled out using a one-quart dipper and put into my old mega pot that used to be my brew kettle way back when. Uh, I started to heat that up using the side burner on my gas grill, which actually worked really well for this. Uh, I got it up to a sacrification temperature, quickly held it there for at about roughly 150 or so. And of course, while this was going on, I also paid attention to the timer on my protein rest and avoided holding that for too long. Uh, so once that 15 minute mark was reached, I went back over to the uh, brew easy and used the brew commander to raise the temperature in the main mash up to the first sacrification rest temperature, the beta sac rest at 146. Simultaneously, I went back over to my decoction, continued to stir it and scrape it off the bottom and keep it from scorching, and uh, started to raise that up to a boil. About 15 minutes into the beta rest, I wanted to confirm my mash pH. Turned out it was about 5.17, so pretty much right on target there. Uh, that's very good for lagers like this. It took about 15 minutes for me to raise the decoction up to a full boil. And once it was boiling, I continued stirring and scraping it uh, for about 20 to 30 minutes until the beta sac rest was completed. At this point, I pulled it off of the side burner and immediately started to add it back into the main mash, just being sure to stir it up thoroughly and keep an eye on that temperature. Uh, turns out I actually undershot my target temperature, so again, I had to rely on the brew commander to really raise it the last few degrees to the 158 mark. I then immediately pulled a second decoction, another 12 quarts, and started to heat that up directly to a boil, again using the side burner on the gas grill. This happened simultaneously to my alpha sacrification rest at 158, uh, which was going on for about 30 minutes. So this decoction only got boiled for about 15 minutes, given the ramp up time, and then I added it back into the main mash fully stirring it up and getting us to that mash out step of 170 Fahrenheit. At this point, I also added in my dark grains and stirred those in thoroughly, trying to maximize the uh, color input that they were going to deliver. I let the mash out stay at 170 Fahrenheit for about 15 minutes, and then I pulled out the grain basket and let that drain for another 15 minutes. While the grain basket was draining, I also started to raise the temperature of the kettle up to just under a boil uh, to get a jump start on everything. Once I hit the boil, I added my 60 minute bittering addition of one ounce of pearl and left it to boil for 50 minutes. At the 10 minute mark, I added in my three ounces of sots, and then I also added in a Whirlflock tablet and some yeast nutrient as well. 10 minutes later, once the boil was complete, I performed a quick whirlpool to coagulate all the trube in this nice tight cone in the center of the kettle before transferring and chilling all in one pass through my counterflow chiller down into my Brewbuilt X2. Uh, I got down to about 72 degrees in this first pass, and then I continued to chill down to the target pitch temperature of 50 degrees uh, throughout the rest of the evening. Once I reached that target pitch temperature, I added in my entire 2-liter starter of Wyeth's 2278 Czech Pilsner yeast, and uh, then took a gravity reading. So when it comes to the fermentation for this beer, first of all, we have to make sure we're using a Czech lager yeast, because we do not want to over attenuate on this beer and leave a beer that is way too dry in the final product. At the very lowest, you want this beer to finish at about 10, 12. Otherwise you're risking not having enough sugar left behind, which can really negatively impact the flavor and make it a little too dry, a little too astringent, uh, especially with that little kiss of roast that you're gonna have in the brew. So once again, I'll be using Czech lager yeast, the uh, Wyeth's 2278 Czech Pilsner strain, uh, and we'll be fermenting this one cold. These are not hybrid lager strains, so they have to be either fermented cold or under pressure to avoid any sort of off flavors based on the fermentation itself. So I really do recommend having temperature control or pressure fermentation set up to get the job done. Traditionally though, these beers were actually open fermented. Um, actually, most historical lagers were open fermented back in the day. Uh, a big, wide, shallow vat was used as a fermenter. The beer was kept cold uh, as it fermented, but it was kept open as well. This is part of what gives Czech lager kind of its 
uh, not to say dirty, but less clean character than most modern German lagers have. Um, because of the open fermentation, you're getting a lot more ester activity and uh, different flavor compounds are being created. This is something that I'm not going to be doing um, because I don't think I can actually pull it off in a sanitary way. Uh, number one, I don't have the appropriate fermenter shape, which is a wide shallow vessel. I can't get that to work in my basement. But secondly, I'm in a basement and it's like the tail end of summer, early fall right now. There's still a significant risk of mold forming. There's still a significant risk of microbes and dust getting in there. It's not something that I think is worth it right now. But if you have any techniques that you use to open ferment lager at home, I would be all ears to hear them because I think that's a really fascinating process. Now, I will not be fermenting this in an open fermenter, but it will be uh, without any added pressure in at the appropriate temperature. So I'll be using a conical fermenter with temperature control to keep it nice and cool, down at about 50 Fahrenheit. And also, as it is very important for this lager, we'll be pitching a very healthy amount of yeast into it. So I made a two liter starter out of two packets of Y yeast. Uh, so about 200 billion cells went into the starter. So we're looking at probably about 300 to 400 billion cells of lager yeast going into this brew uh, as I pitch it. This will be fermented for about two weeks at 50 Fahrenheit and then I will bring it up to um, a diacetyl rest for about another week at about 60 Fahrenheit to 65 Fahrenheit. Um, let it rest there until I don't taste diacetyl and then we will cold crash and we will actually be traditionally lagering this one as well. Um, so that means no cold side findings going in. I love my cold side findings because I like to make my lagers quickly. If we're doing everything else authentically and I'm putting this much effort into doing things the hard way and the old traditional way, I might as well lager the old way as well, right? So once the fermentation is complete, once the diastole rest is complete, we will lager this one storing it very cold, as close to freezing as possible in my fermenter. I will dump out the uh, yeast cone and I will let this sit in the conical fermenter at as cold as I can get it down to close to freezing for a month at least, until it is looking like this, crystal clear, as it comes out of the sample port. During the lagering process, I will naturally carbonate the beer and uh, hopefully by the time that lagering process is complete after about a month, we'll have a crystal clear, fully carbonated beer that I can transfer into a keg and we can serve out of a Luker faucet into this mug. I'm really, really excited for this. Now, unless you really want to do all of these things the hard way like I'm doing them, there's no real need to go that in depth. If you want to go ahead and do a quick lager with this one, then feel free to do so. If you want a cold side, fine it, feel free to do so. Hell, if you don't even want to use Czech lager yeast, then I guess feel free to do so. Um, but I do recommend that you do. And even if you're typically a quick lager guy like I am, I do recommend going through the process, doing things the hard way at least once to get an appreciation for the way things are done. It really does change the way the beer tastes at the end of the day, whether that's a placebo effect based on how much effort and work you put into the whole thing uh, that makes you love the beer more, or if it's actually a thing, don't necessarily know, but I think it's well worth doing at least once. As far as alternative yeasts go on this beer, um, there's a handful of Czech lager yeasts out there from Y yeast, from White Labs, from Imperial. Um, they're all pretty great strains and I've used many of them before. If you can't find a Czech lager strain, a, a reasonable substitute is a Bavarian lager strain or a Munich lager strain. Um, Again, focus on that attenuation characteristic of the yeast. Make sure you're not getting something that attenuates more than like 70 to 75%. This is one of those rare lagers that I would actually not recommend using Lutric of Eichfor or uh, using the uh, Saf Lager W3474. Both of those are going to really chew through sugars and attenuate quite a bit. So um, if you need to use dry lager yeast, I think there's a Mangrove Jacks Czech Pilsner strain, but I'm not 100% positive on that one. This is just one of those rare beers where uh, the dry yeast options for it really aren't that that good um, and just there's not the right strain. Uh, the only good options here are in liquid form and you're just going to have to take that into consideration. It's not really that big of a deal as long as you're making a starter with it and just taking care of your pitch rate. Um, but at the end of the day, you have to use the right yeast to get the true Czech lager character out of this, I think. So anyway, guys, I'm really excited to see how this goes. It's gonna take a while to be ready, but I think it will definitely be well worth it in the end. So I will see you in a few months. <laughs> and until then, Nazdravi.
So the beer took about two weeks to reach its final gravity of about 1015, uh, which is exactly on target for me. And then I raised it up to 68 Fahrenheit for a diacetyl rest for another week. Once I couldn't taste diacetyl in the samples I was drawing from the fermenter, I went ahead and cold crashed down to 35 degrees and held it there for just short of a month uh, as I was basically lagering it traditionally. Over the first few days in this cold crash, all the yeast dropped to the bottom of the conical and I dumped the yeast out the bottom port and then let the beer sit in the fermenter at cold lager temperatures for the better part of a month. Once this lager was complete and I saw that the beer was pouring mostly clear, I transferred into a keg and uh, put it on tap and it was ready to serve right away. Moreover, I'm serving this in a really fun and authentically Czech way with a Luker side pull faucet. So this should be a lot of fun. So this beer is called The Power of the Dark Side. And it comes in at 5.6% ABV and 28 IBUs. So I'm actually pouring this out of a traditional side pull lucre faucet, which has this little screen on the uh, inside of the faucet that diffuses air and knocks a lot of carbonation out of the beer to create this luxurious, super stable, super dense foamy head. Um, and in fact, if it looks like I'm pouring a ton of foam on this beer, that's actually the way it's supposed to be. This is my attempt at pouring a traditional Hladinka style pour, which is two thirds beer, one third foam. And the way you do this is you pour the foam portion before you actually stick the faucet directly into the beer itself and then pour the beer under the foam. It's the densest, creamiest head I've ever poured on a beer. It also has a really cool effect on the beer itself in that it actually acts very similarly to a cask style pour, uh, infusing air into the beer and it really allows tons and tons of flavors to shine in a really unique way. For the appearance of the beer, it pours a really black color uh, at initial observation, but when you get close to it, you can see that it's not only crystal clear, but it's also got these really nice red tones to it. Uh, for the portions of the beer that you can actually see through when the light hits it correctly, it really is a dark shade of ruby red, and then that head, that amazing head, shows up with uh, just a really nice kind of ivory cream colored head. It's a beautiful sight to behold, and the beer that's underneath tastes absolutely phenomenal. So without further ado, let's go in for aroma. So the aroma I'm getting out of this beer is amazing. It's uh, chocolatey. It's got this kind of slight fruity edge to it. Uh, fresh kind of uh, brownies character to it as well. Uh, just a really nice, rich, malty aroma without being overpowering. Let's go in now for mouthfeel. <laughs> That's amazing. Normally when you're drinking a lager, you might expect that mouthfeel to be light, clean, crisp, and generally not that much to discuss. Um, but with this beer, it is entirely something else to discuss. Firstly and foremost, this beer is incredibly soft on the palate. That is a combination of both the incredibly soft water profile and also that Lucre Faucet pour. The body is still light, it's easy drinking. Because of that slight fluffiness um, in the mouthfeel, it does kind of prevent it from having the traditional kind of crisp, uh, snappy kind of lager character. But that's not a bad thing because the way this fits into the overall beer's character, um, I wouldn't have it any other way, to be honest. The carbonation is soft and gentle, even though it's relatively well carbonated, and it really just feels so unique. It's almost like cask in a way, uh, in that it does kind of change the way that the beer tastes and feels in the mouth. That being said, it doesn't feel the same way as an ale does that has that same kind of pillowy, fluffy mouthfeel. It's still less than that. It's still lighter than that. And I think that's very important uh, a distinction to make. But now for the reward for all that hard work and all that waiting that we've done, the final flavor of this beer. This is hands down, I think the best lager I have ever made. Seriously, um, all of that work, all of that effort, all of that time and waiting, and all of the delicate attention to detail paid off so much in this beer. So let's go in for that flavor. Mm. It's got that nice, robust Czech maltiness, first and foremost. Um, there is a really, really nice degree of rich, kind of toasty, honey bready like Pilsner malt character with that little bit of uh, Munich in there as well. And that is 
the base and the foundation of this flavor. And then on top of that, we get that nice toffee-like decoction character. It's different than the melanoidin malt would deliver, I think. It's got this kind of rich toffiness to it um, that really sets this apart. And then the presence of the dark malt makes itself known just a slight little bit. Um, it's like this cold, not smoky, but um, almost kind of chocolatey character. It almost feels like chocolate milk um, <laughs> in the way that it comes across. It's not bitter, it's not harsh, it's not astringent, it's incredibly soft, um, and it's not the traditional roasty flavor you might expect from something like Carafa Special 3. It is something entirely in a class of its own, and I am so happy with it. The way all the flavors come together in this beer is just something so special, and I cannot explain just how much this whole thing harmonizes together in such a great way. Then also certainly uh, expressing themselves in the flavor are the hops, the sots that's coming through so, so beautifully. Another great thing that that Luger faucet does, it agitates all of the aromatics in the beer and brings them out on the surface. And you get this wonderful, noble, spicy character uh, to the beer that really sings with those malt flavors. The bitterness is right on point too. It's a perfectly balanced character. Not too sweet, not too bitter. I wouldn't touch it or change a thing about that. And then last but certainly not least is the yeast. Yes, it's a lager and it's relatively clean overall and doesn't really have too much in terms of the flavor, but there's a smidgen of little dirty kind of lager fermentation in there. You're getting a little bit of a berry, you're getting a little bit of diacetyl in there. And my goodness, it's beautiful in the way that it all comes together. It's just it got this wonderful, wonderful uh, just marriage of all of these flavors from all the four primary beer ingredients. And um, I wouldn't change a thing about it. There's no potential improvements I have for this. It's just, honestly, it's the best lager I've ever made. And I wish I had 10, 15, 20 gallons of this thing. This beer was absolutely worth the effort and absolutely worth waiting for and taking all that time to put together. Um, and there's not a thing I would change. Perhaps I'm a little biased on the results of this because Czech Dark Lager is one of my favorite beers and I'm just so over the moon that I was able to deliver it in as good of a way as possible, I think, for myself and my setup, but uh, man, I'm proud of this beer. And if you wanna brew this beer, please try it the old-fashioned way. Do it the hard way once, at least. Um, it may only deliver two to 3% more flavor impact, but uh, man, is it worth it when it comes to actually tasting that final product a month or so later, and your patience is rewarded. And it feels like I've put so much more into this beer. It feels like I've done uh, the extra mile to make it such a good beer, and it's so worth it at the end, because this is honestly one of my favorite beers of the entire year, uh, easily. I really hope you enjoyed this video. This was a ton of fun to produce, a ton of work to produce, um, and a lot of patience. I had a baby in the middle of the whole thing, so it was uh, quite the journey. But I really do hope you guys enjoyed it. And if you did, please hit the like button. If you learned something, hit the like button. Please subscribe if you haven't already and comment down below with your thoughts on the whole thing. If you wanna support the channel, please consider picking up a t-shirt like the one I'm wearing right here. Uh, you can find this design and many others in the merchandise store, which I have linked in the description box. Uh, there's also a Patreon down there and my Patreon supporters are really instrumental in helping bring higher production quality to this channel. And they're also helping me fund things like that Lucre faucet. It's not cheap, but it's totally worth it. There's also channel memberships that I have available and there's the super thanks button if you feel inclined to hit either of those options. They do help me out quite a bit as well and you have my, my appreciation and thanks. And there's also my Amazon store, which is in the description box with all of my uh, homebrewing equipment and stuff that I recommend that's on Amazon, as well as uh, the channel production equipment as well, if you're curious about that. If you're curious about following me on more than just YouTube, I am available on Instagram and Facebook as the apartment brewer so check those links out when you got some time and last but certainly not least if you're still here thanks for watching all the way to the end of the video as always it really does mean a lot to me but especially in this video because this one took the most work and the most time to put together in recent memory so it especially matters to me this time around so thank you very very much and until the next one this is the drop.